invite you to open with me uh, to your Bibles to Psalm 23. Before we dive in, let's pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together in the middle of the week to sing praise to you together, to look at your word together, being reminded of your faithfulness and your goodness to us. It's all about you. And I pray that you would shine through in this text. Give me words to say. And may it minister to the hearts of the people here. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. 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 So Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, an often quoted and very popular psalm. When I was talking to Chad about doing Psalm 23, he said that that one ranked the top, and so I had to look at it for myself. And there was a website that, yes, ranked it at the top as number one. One reason I chose it is because this is one of the, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I have meditated the most on, that I have, I, was, I have learned it when I was in Awanas, back when I was a Sparky. And it's still stuck with me. I did know it in the King James, but I did ESV this evening. <clears throat> but what makes this psalm so popular? Why is it so dearly loved by people? For many, it is a source of comfort. It helps calm them down and get them through anxious or dark times. Other times, as uh, although not as often, I would say it has been a challenge to people. It's been something a little bit hard to swallow. And why is that? Well, we're going to look at that briefly. But first off, we have to look at this psalm, and that is, you know, this is a psalm of David. David himself was a shepherd. So what he's writing about here, he is not, it's not foreign to him. He knows what he's talking about. And so who better to show us what the Lord is like than a shepherd himself? And as we look at this, we have to remember, we are looking at this through the lens of the gospel. We are looking at this as, be, as believers in Jesus Christ. The first line of this psalm is, the Lord is my shepherd. And as one commentator obviously points out, this psalm only applies to you if the Lord is your shepherd. If you are following Jesus, then everything in this psalm is for you. But if you're not, well then I hope that as we go through this that you will see the beauty of Jesus and what he has done. Now as we look at this psalm, we have to look at and see who we are in this. Throughout scripture, we are referred to as sheep. And it's not a flattering comparison. John Corson points out, like many commentators and preachers, that sheep are clueless. They have been known to wander off cliffs one after another to their destruction. He goes on to point out that the, shepherd, that the sheep's defenselessness and desperate need for a shepherd. This is who we are. 
In Isaiah 53, it talks about all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And that way is whatever way we want, which usually is sin. And it gets us into trouble. When left to ourselves, we make a wreck of it all. We need someone to guide us. We need a shepherd to keep us on the right path. And to make us rest when we need to rest. To feed us when we need to be fed. Now, if we're the sheep, then who is the shepherd? Pretty obviously, the shepherd is is the Lord. The name there, though, is... um, Many of your Bibles probably capitalize that. And what it's referring to is the covenant name of God, Yahweh. This should be astounding to us that the God of the universe, this is his personal name here. This, his covenantal name. Yahweh is our shepherd. And looking at this through the gospel, Jesus himself referred to himself, he referred to himself as the good shepherd. There are many passages in the New Testament and in the Old to where Jesus is alluded to as the shepherd. So we see this. The fulfillment of this text is in Christ. Jesus said that he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is, in Hebrews, he is called the great shepherd of the sheep. And in 1 Peter, he is referred to as the chief shepherd, showing that he is above all the under-shepherds or the overseers of the church. And again, the covenant name of God is personal to us And he is our shepherd. Even today when I was reciting this to myself, I was struck struck with the the, uh, reality once again of emphasizing certain words and meditating on what these words mean. So the Lord is my shepherd. He is mine. He is one who is directing me. He is one who is guiding me. If If I am in need I look to him. Now, of course, the second line of that is saying, I shall not want. And it goes on to talk about how he makes us lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. Here we see the provision of the Lord. Now, this is not a, some people might take this as a promise of material wealth. That they will have no lack of money or possessions. But that is so not the case. The Lord Jesus knows that money does not help. Sometimes it just corrupts. The Apostle Paul talks about how people who chase riches, they pierce themselves with many pains. And the Lord knows this. Any blessing we have from the Lord, whether physical or spiritual, it is from Him. But it is not to be the focus. And here He shows that He provides us rest and peace. He restores our broken and weary souls. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, when He is preaching to the people. He says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your Heavenly Father knows what you, that you need them all. One of the commentators talked about how a little child summed up this psalm as in, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not worry. He got it wrong in the wording, but he got it right in the message. If the Lord is our shepherd, we have no need to worry. Yet how many times do we needlessly worry? 
Even myself, as I was preparing for this, I was very anxious, very nervous, and yet, I, I am, yet I'm confronted with the reality that I am preaching on a text that is telling me not to worry and be anxious. I guess that's how it works, right? Amen. Usually what we are studying or preparing to share with people is something we need to learn ourselves. Something I need to learn, be reminded of. Now, if He is providing for us everything that we need, we shall not want, we shall not have any lack. If we don't have it, it's because we didn't need it. But why is He doing this? We talked about, I mentioned how this is, you know, this is a psalm is a source of comfort and it's a source of challenge. People are challenged by this if they look closely. Because when it talks about that he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There's a very popular sermon by uh, Pastor Matt Chandler where he delivered a message from the beginning of this psalm to a church who turns out they did not want to hear his message. They thought it was all about them. He was there to to go against what everybody else was thinking and what everybody else was teaching and would say, no, it's not about you, it's about God. Too many times we make this life about us and we make these blessings about us and it's not. When we look at this psalm, it is supposed to teach us about the Lord and who He is. And we are obviously a part of that. But he is showing us his faithfulness, his goodness, and his zeal for his glory and his name. Amen. And that does make us uncomfortable. It makes me a little uncomfortable. Because sometimes I like to make it about myself. Like I think we all probably do at one point or what time or another. But we need to trust him knowing that if he's more concerned about his own name and his own glory, it is for our best. And moving on, we talked about the provision of the Lord and we'll see the presence of the Lord. In verse 4 it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I don't know about you, but my, uh, my ESV Bible has some little footnotes here, talking about alternative translations of some of these phrases here. One of them here is uh, valley of deep darkness. Sometimes we go through a season to where we are in darkness. We are in fear. We don't know how things are going to turn out. We think that, how can God possibly turn the situation around? <coughs> We either get depressed, discouraged, one thing to point out here too, and I love looking at the little words here, because words tell us a lot. It said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he doesn't say, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. It's walking through it. We are passing through it. You are passing through it. It is not a place where you're stopping. It is not a place where you're um, going to set up shop. You're passing through. I heard a pastor say one time that for the Christian, the best is always yet to come. This life very well may be plagued with darkness, and it may feel like you really are just in that valley. But as we see at the end of the song, he is heading towards something. We are heading towards something. We are heading to the fullness of joy. Being in the presence of the Lord forevermore. 
So we do not need to fear what this life brings. We do not need to fear death. John Calvin kind of paints this picture quite, uh, quite vividly. When he talks about it, David here makes an allusion to the dark recesses or dens of wild beasts. To which when an individual approaches, he is suddenly seized at his first entrance with an apprehension and fear of death. When I read that, that kind of, you know, I was like, oh, well, yeah, that kind of gives me pause. And really brings more of a, brings a weight to what we're reading here. When we follow Jesus, it is not a promise of the absence, absen, yeah, sorry, absence of danger or conflict, but it's a prom, promise of his presence and his grace. We, it can't all just be green pastures, and it can't all be still waters. There are those times, but we do have to be taken through deep darkness at times. We may not understand why, but years from now, we may. Or we may never, but maybe our children know, or our grandchildren, or somehow somebody else who hears. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about how he was dealing with something. He had a thorn in the flesh, and he was pleading with God to remove it. And what did Jesus reply? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Another well-known figure in Christianity who dealt with darkness quite often was Charles Spurgeon. He dealt with deep depression. He didn't even know why. But it would just hit him sometimes like that. He also suffered physically. I read of one account where he was, he was suffering so much and he was crying out in pain. And he had everybody leave the room. And so and he was pleading before God and asking him to take the pain away. And the Lord did. And he said he never felt pain that severe again. Still had pain but not that severe. The Lord's presence came to him in that moment. And for us, we're not alone. Lord Jesus said that he will never leave us or forsake us. When I was studying for this, I was, you know, you know, Everybody in here, parent, you know, you know what it's like when you have little kids. Sometimes you can't get things done that you want to get done. And so I was trying to study, and then, lo and behold, my daughter, Ellie, it was nighttime. She was, she was uh, in bed. She did not want to be there by herself. And I'm thinking as I'm getting there, I'm like, okay, I need to study. I need to work on this. And, and I'm like, Lord, what, is there something I should learn from this situation? And then she's like, I want you. Ellie's telling me. She's like, I want you. Sometimes she's afraid of the dark. Sometimes she just wants us right there. It's like, we're just right in the living room. But no, she wants us in there. And it made me think of the first verse of this song. It said, I shall not want. My daughter was wanting my presence right then. Although, and I, and I gave it for a time until she fell asleep and then I could slip away. But the Lord never slips away. We are not in want for his presence. We are not in want for his grace. He is there to help and is there to guide. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I've heard this text preached that the shepherd's rod and staff were like used to break the sheep's legs if they wandered off and so they'd stay close had to be carried I've heard that interpreted this way and as I was studying the text I'm like I get it but I don't really see it here 
And I had somebody tell me twice, actually, they told me uh, when I, they heard I was preaching this psalm, they told me again today, they said, the rod and the staff are for comfort, not to beat the sheep. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and as I was leaving, I was like, yes, but the Lord disciplines. So that question has to be dealt with. I don't think it is there for our comfort, for our protection, but are there times where the Lord does discipline us and does let our uh, sinful desires unfold and we get ourselves into trouble? As we see in Scripture, yes, He does. In Hebrews 12, we read where says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. There was a time in my life when I just felt like I was felt like I was being disciplined. I was going through some dark times. I kind of felt like I was being beat over the head. And then I came to where this is also said in Proverbs. And it gave me comfort knowing that the Lord loves me. The Lord loves you. And when he disciplines, it is for your good and for the glory of his name. So... If he is providing for us and he has his presence and he also does discipline us, you know, he does bless us as well. Verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Once again, it's not a removal from the danger and suffering, but his presence in it. How many of you would like to eat at a table with your enemy right there? People who want you gone. Remember, David's the one who wrote this. He was no stranger to people wanting to kill him at all times in his life. When I was trying to figure out, okay, what does he mean by anointing head with oil? Commentators will give you a range of ideas. Some of them, I kind of want to laugh at, but just because, but you get one saying that the, uh, the oil was protection for the sheep from bugs and things, and also in case they got headbutted. I guess it would just glance off. I don't know. I mean, as they kept trying to apply, I was like, okay, I understand what you're saying. Because one thing that's common throughout these commentators, though, is they always come back to like this is representative of the Holy Spirit. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to work fruit in us, to make us more like Christ, and to guide us, to convict us, and to intercede for us when we don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit is a blessing because without it, without Him, where would we be? Other commentator talks about how the hosts at banquets, we used to put oil on the heads of their, the foreheads of their uh, the people attending. You know, to be the children of the Lord, it is an honorable thing. To be a part of his flock, it is an honorable thing. Coming to verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A major application of this song is, do you trust him? Do you really trust the Good Shepherd? Do you trust Him to go to those green pastures? Do you trust Him to 
drink from those still waters when he's taking you there? Do you trust him that everything is going to be okay when you are traveling through the valley of the shadow of death? Do you trust in his goodness? Do you trust in his faithfulness? I love how this psalm ends with, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When you get to the end of your life and you look back over it, you'll be able to see to where he was faithful. I didn't know how he would come through, but he came through. It was, it was dark and depressing there, but I saw and experienced the joy of the Lord. I saw anew the atonement in Jesus. When we look back over our lives of following Christ, we will see to where His providence brought about the greatest good. And right now you can look back and think those times. And do you trust him to go forward? Every day is a battle. Every day is a battle to continue to trust our Savior, knowing that he knows what is best. We know that we are heading towards a heavenly home. That we are heading towards something that we can't even comprehend. The happiness and the joy that we feel here is nothing compared to what we'll experience in His presence fully. We need to trust in His faithfulness that He will do what He said He will do. And that His Goodness and mercy in his love will always follow us. And that if we trust him and follow him, so we'll always be headed towards. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are our shepherd. You know things that we can never know or ever comprehend. You know the goodness that will come from our suffering. You know the needs that we have. You know us better than we know ourselves. I pray that as we saw in this psalm and as we continue to look at your word throughout our, the rest of our days that we will come to know you more and in that knowledge we will trust you more. I pray as we come to a time of prayer together that you would show us more of yourself. And we feel your presence, knowing that in you everything is secure. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.